Howdy. I'd like to welcome you all very warmly from our discussion tonight on From NAFTA to USMCA and Beyond, the Future of Trade Policy here at the Bush School DC teaching site. For those of you who don't know, I'm Raymond Robertson, and I'm the director of the Mossbacker Institute for Trade, Economics, and Public Policy at the Bush School of Government and Public Service in College Station, Texas. I'm really pleased that you can all join us tonight, and all of us here at the Bush School are really happy to have you both in person and online for the second in our third uh, three lectures in our economic diplomacy series. The goal of the economic diplomacy series is to highlight the tools of US economic diplomacy that are an essential part of advancing a free market rule of law model for economic growth and for countering China's authoritarian communist approach. This three-part series is designed for those interested in developing a practical understanding of the various levers that are used to support US goals, both at home and abroad, including foreign assistance, which we talked about last month, trade, which we're talking about this month, and development finance, which we'll be talking about next month. Tonight, as I mentioned, we're focusing on international trade and specifically that of trade here in North America. We're extremely thrilled to have Ambassador Carla Hills with us tonight, especially because this is the eve of the 30th anniversary of the historic signing of the North American Free Trade Agreement. This is something, by the way, that I have commemorated with a photo that sits on the wall in my office. So this is something I've been thinking about for a very long time. And so I'm especially excited about hearing Ambassador Hills' remarks about her reflections on that momentous day, the impact that NAFTA had both in the United States, but also in Canada and Mexico, not just economically, of course, but also as a tool of economic diplomacy. And what happened next, which was the revision with the USMCA, and most importantly, perhaps, the future of international trade policy. But before we get started, I would like to recognize a very special guest that we have here in person tonight, which is Ambassador Carolina Barco. Thank you so much for joining us. She's the former Colombian foreign minister who's always added a special flair to our gatherings and we're extremely proud and, and honored to have you with us tonight. I'd also like to uh, acknowledge Neil Bush, the chair of the Bush School Advisory Board, who's joining us in the Zoom audience uh, as well. So thank you very much, uh, Neil, for joining us. During the question and answer uh, period of, of tonight's talk, which will follow Ambassador Hill's remarks, if you have questions here, please join me up at the podium. Just come on up here and ask your question because this is the only mic that's working. So we need you to speak directly. Otherwise, the ambassador won't be able to hear you. Um, so that's going to be clear. And for those of you uh, watching at home or at work in Zoom, uh, we have provided a link uh, for your questions. You can submit your questions online and I will have them. And they are on my phone. So I just want to let you all know that if I look at my phone, I'm not bored with the event. I'm just trying to follow questions. I do want to point out, though, for all of you who might be asking questions, that tonight's event is recorded. So anything you say up here will be recorded. So keep that in mind. If you're not comfortable with that, then just maybe save your comments for later. Uh, and we're going to be posting the event on the Mossbacker Institute's website uh, early next week. So now in order to kick things off, it's a great honor for me to now invite to the podium Robert Mosbacher Jr., the ninth president and CEO of the Overseas Private Investment Corporation and current chair of the Development Advisory Council of the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation for remarks and an introduction to tonight's speaker. Rob. Thank you very much. Howdy. Howdy. Glad to be here with you tonight. Thank you all for coming. Thank all of you who are online for joining us. And thanks most of all to my friend, Ambassador Carla Hills. I was so thrilled that, uh, that she agreed to, to uh, join us tonight. And um, because uh, my dad was serving in the cabinet uh, with, uh, with her during the Bush 41 administration and, and was a great admirer and I've been ever since. So um, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity to hear one of the foremost experts on trade and trade policy. Um, I also want to shamelessly promote uh, the last piece of this series uh, for November 10th. Uh, we, we started, as you know, or many of you know, with uh, Mark Green to talk about foreign assistance or official development assistance and its role in, in uh, 
part, integral part of American foreign policy. Uh, tonight, we will, we will address the trade issue. And then um, in early November, uh, I will be talking about the broader sort of development finance, how we uh, support, facilitate investment uh, in middle and low income countries, how we do that in competition with uh, virtually the rest of the world, but most importantly, in recent years with China. It's a critical part of that uh, sort of troika of, of uh, tools that are available uh, to help us uh, extend and, and project uh, a rule of law, free market approach to economic growth and opportunity. So let me introduce Ambassador Hills to you. Uh, she was a US Special Trade Representative from 1989 to 1993. Uh, as a member of President Bush 41's cabinet, uh, she was uh, the president's principal advisor uh, on international trade policy and as the nation's chief trade negotiator, uh, representing American interest and in, represented American interests in multilateral uh, and bilateral negotiations all over the world. She negotiated and concluded the North American Free Trade Agreement, which she will uh, talk at great at some length about tonight. She led the U.S. negotiations uh, on the Uruguay round of the World Trade Organization, and she was involved in negotiating and concluding uh, a large number of trade and uh, investment agreements with countries all over the world. Earlier, Ambassador Hill served as Secretary of the Department of Housing and Urban Development, uh, she was actually the third woman to hold a cabinet position. She also served as assistant uh, attorney general in the civil division of the U.S. Department of Justice. And before entering government, uh, she was a founding partner of uh, what is now known as the Munger, Tolls, and Olson law firm. She also served as an adjunct professor at UCLA uh, law school teaching antitrust law, and she co-authored uh, a book called The Antitrust Advisor, which was published by McGraw-Hill. Over the years, she served on a number of boards of Fortune 500 companies. Uh, today, she's on the International Advisory Board of the J.P. Morgan Chase Company and on the Advisory Board of the C.V. Star uh, Car Company Incorporated. She also has served in leadership positions uh, with several not-for-profit organizations, including having uh, having in, uh, become chair emeritus of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, uh, as well as serving on the board of the Inter-American Dialogue uh, and the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, she also was co-chair emeritus of the Council on Foreign Relations. She graduated from Stanford University she got her law degree from Yale University. She's been honored in many, many places, but perhaps one that was, uh, I think, uh, particularly unique and outstanding was she received the Aztec uh, Eagle Award from the Mexican government, which is the highest award uh, that can be given to a non-citizen. So it is with uh, great pleasure and great admiration uh, that uh, I introduce and, and turn the podium over to you, metaphorically, Carla oh. Hills. Thank you very much, Rob. It's a pleasure to join you and Raymond Robinson. I only wish I were there in person. And uh, it's uh, interesting to have the opportunity to talk about the positive impact that uh, trade has had and can continue to have on our nation's well-being economically. Um, as uh, has already been mentioned, I've been asked to share my views on trade and the impact of the North American Free Trade Agreement, the NAFTA, and the prospects for future trade arrangements. It's timely to reflect upon our trade arrangements in this year of key anniversaries, the 30th anniversary of the NAFTA, the 25th anniversary of the Bush School, which commenced its classes here in DC in, on trade and, and uh, economics just last year. Our 41st president, George Herbert Walker Bush, cared deeply about trade as an avenue for expanding our global relationships. At my swearing in, he stated, we don't want an America that is closed to the world. What we want is a world that is open to America. And as a veteran of World War II, he was very proud 
of our nation's post-war diplomatic leadership. We were a major force in skillfully using our economic and diplomatic powers to help build a global regime that dramatically advanced the well-being of our own nation and the world at large. For more than half a century, a majority of our leaders, whether Democrat or Republican, firmly believed that the free flow of goods, services, ideas, and capital would provide economic benefits to nations both rich and poor. Today, the estimates are that the U.S. economy is $1 trillion richer as a result of our opening global markets to trade and investment. Market openings have also strengthened the economies of our allies. Importantly, developing countries benefited as well. According to studies by Dr. Bill Klein at the Peterson Institute for International Economics, the removal of trade barriers to goods produced by developing countries has a direct correlation to their success in reducing their poverty. His calculations show that on average, when a poor country increases its ratio of trade to total output by just 1%, it achieves an equivalent reduction in its poverty. And reducing global poverty not only advances our humanitarian goals by incorporating poor countries into trade regimes as they climb the economic ladder, they often become our future trade partners. And their development also helps reduce potential national security challenges for when an impoverished nation loses the ability to enforce their laws or to seal their borders, too often they slip into the status of a failed state, making it difficult to combat terrorism and crime. The North, of free, uh, the North American Free Trade Agreement negotiated during President Bush Sr.'s administration illustrates a number of these benefits. Let me begin by just naming a few. It was the first comprehensive free trade agreement to join a developing country with developed economies. And by linking the economies of Canada, the United States and Mexico, it created a huge market, which today accounts for $22 trillion and 493 million consumers. It eliminated tariffs on all industrial products and almost all agricultural products. It was the first trade agreement to open a broad range of services, including financial services, and to provide uh, national treatment for cross-border service providers. It opened up at the automotive, textile, and apparel markets between the United States and Mexico, and it removed significant investment barriers and created an effective dispute settlement mechanism to ensure that North American investors who had access to neutral third-party arbitrations where there was a disagreement with the host government. And finally, it was the first trade agreement to establish enforceable protections for copyrights, trademarks, patents, and trade secrets. This expanded coverage provided a template for future regional and bilateral trade agreements. But it also provided a powerful example globally, giving a much needed push to the Uruguay round, the eighth round of multilateral trade negotiations that had been launched in 1986 to upgrade the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, the GATT, which primarily dealt only with tariffs. The Uruguay round virtually collapsed in 1991, but in April of 1994, four months after the NAFTA took effect, trade ministers from then all 123 participating nations met in Marrakesh and concluded the Uruguay round of negotiations, agreeing to incorporate many of the new market openings for agriculture, services, investment, protection of intellectual property, and more that had been set forth in the NAFTA. And they agreed to create the World Trade Organization to resolve disputes. The NAFTA had a major impact here in North America as well. Interregional trade is up some sixfold since the agreement was implemented. 
all three economies benefited and none more than the United States. Today, Canada and Mexico are our two largest export markets. Roughly one third of our global exports go to our two neighbors. More than 40 million American jobs depend on our global trade and 14 million of which depend on our trade with Canada and Mexico. The estimates are that 5 million of those jobs resulted from the increase in trade generated by the NAFTA. We sell more goods to Mexico than we sell to all the rest of Latin America. And we sell more goods to Mexico than we sell to Germany, France, and Britain combined. The NAFTA has been a major benefit for our farmers as well, who because of the opening of North American uh, markets to agricultural products saw their exports to Canada increase by 300% and to Mexico by more than 500%. Importantly, the NAFTA opened markets and created clearer rules, clearly benefiting our entrepreneurs, large businesses and small businesses and in all 50 states. According to the Chamber of Commerce, of the roughly 300,000 US companies that export, 98% are small and medium sized businesses, and they account for one third of our total merchandise exports. Our economic relationships with our neighbors are deeply entwined in so many ways. We do not simply sell things to one another, we make things together. Roughly 40% of what the United States imports from Mexico consists of US content and 25% of our imports from Canada com contain US content. The equivalent figure with respect to two of our other top four trading partners, China and Japan are roughly 4% and 2%. That high US content contained in our neighbors exports abroad make them not only vibrant trading partners, but also very effective export agents for our goods. Canada has trade agreements with 51 governments and Mexico with 50. Both have trade agreements with the European Union representing 27 states. In short, each have more than twice the number of trade agreements that we have. And in addition, both are participants in the Trans-Pacific Partnership that the last administration pulled out of. Since exports from both nations have high U.S. content, those exports give the U.S. producers of that content preferential access to markets where we have our access is far more restricted. And we should not lose sight of the fact that benefits that flow from our imports more than 60% of our imports consist of intermediate products and raw materials. And special specialization within North America make us more competitive. Expanded trade and people-to-people -people bonds among our three countries have also fueled tourism, which in 2021, although down from the pre-pandemic levels, contributed roughly 1.3 trillion dollars to our GDP and supported 9 million jobs. Canada and Mexico constitute by far our top two sources of tourism. The increased vibrancy of our economic bonds stimulated by the NAFTA improved our overall relationships with our two neighbors and encouraged the three governments to work together on a range of issues. Too often we forget that in the 70s and 80s, both governments harbored a good deal of anti-American sentiment. In Canada, that sentiment was fueled partly by its hostility to our involvement in the Vietnam War and its resentment with respect to our negative reaction to its recognition of China and Cuba. In Mexico, the resentment lingered from earlier border disputes and the passage of the Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1980 that cracked down on immigration just as oil prices plummeted and Mexico found itself deeply in debt. 
this hostility receded as economic relationships increased, which encouraged our governments to collaborate in a number of other areas. Prior to the last administration, the leaders of our three governments met annually, sometimes more often, at what became known as the Three Amigos meeting. They began to work together to improve efficiency and security at our border. Effectively managing a border requires attention on both sides. They agreed to share intelligence, which enabled our governments to focus more effectively on the real dangers of crime while expediting legitimate cross-border movement of people and products. And they created the North American Competitiveness Council, comprised of senior representatives from the private sector of each country to provide recommendations on actions that the TRIO might take to strengthen regional competitiveness. The interaction of business leaders created another pillar to uphold and expand the North American partnership. Mayors and governors were also involved in the efforts to enhance cooperation, which facilitated projects like the Sky Bridge, linking the San Diego and Tijuana airports. The number of sister cities increased. Last November, President Biden convened the first meeting of the three leaders meeting after a five-year hiatus. My hope is that we can continue to build on our relationships with our neighbors that enables all three of us to deal more effectively with the multitude of challenges that we confront today. And what is the near-term future of trade? Although the president's inbox is overflowing, our nation would benefit from making progress on a number of issues of trade that have been pushed aside because of the pandemic, the war in Ukraine, concerns about China and the upcoming elections. And they include the need to gradually and mutually lift the tariffs imposed by the US and Canada, or by, excuse me, by US and China, working with allies to update our World Trade Organization, persuading Congress to pass trade promotion authority so we can effectively negotiate new trade agreements, rejoining the Trans-Pacific Partnership and negotiating the Transatlantic and Investment Partnership. If we are to move forward on any of these issues, we will need to do a better job to inform the public about the benefits of trade. Too many Americans are not only unaware of the benefits, they have been persuaded that trade agreements like the NAFTA result in job loss. Governors, mayors, business leaders, and educational institutions like the Bush uh, School all have a role to play in explaining the benefits that flow from trade. Facts matter. While it is true that manufacturing jobs have declined over the past quarter century, that decline began in the 80s, well before the NAFTA. Today, U.S. factories produce twice what they did 30 years ago with half the workers. While technology has caused an upward shift in jobs and a sizable increase in the national GDP, those facts are of cold comfort to the worker who loses his or her job and does not have the training to obtain a new one. We need more effective social programs to help connect and train unemployed workers for jobs that exist today and will develop tomorrow. Technology is changing fast and it will continue to do so. We need to make an investment in our human infrastructure. And there are a number of ideas that have been suggested. For example, to name a few, we could make better use of the internet to match job seekers with job openings nationwide. If we posted a description of all job openings available, the location and the salary, allowing a worker laid off, for example, in Nevada to see a job posted to his or her liking in Colorado. The federal government could provide a mobility stipend to cover the relocation costs. 
the company in need of the worker would provide the training, generally about 20 weeks. After the government could, the government, state and local, could establish uh, public-private partnerships to create training centers to train workers in areas where there is high need. After the worker is trained for and then hired for the new job, the worker would pay taxes on income earned rather than collect an unemployment check. The cost would be an investment in our future, rather like the Marshall Plan. And there are other ideas as well. Let me just close by saying we need to do all we can to keep our markets open. And none of our markets are more important than those of Canada and Mexico. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Hills. Those remarks are incredibly inspiring and they're the same kind of remarks that have inspired my entire career, especially initiated uh, through your early work on NAFTA. They're, they're so timely today because as you know, the world is going through somewhat of a, a crisis in terms of trade. The share of trade in global GDP has been falling and there's a somewhat of a global pessimism about trade. Um, so if, if I may, I'd like to take this opportunity as the person up here, <laughs> to yeah. ask the first question, maybe inspire some of you others to, to come up. And that is to say, how can the United States actually re-inspire the, take leadership in the world, right, to try and turn around the global pessimism that we see on trade? Is there a way for U.S. to exercise its economic diplomacy to regain that leadership in trade? Definitely, I think we have a role to play. I mentioned a couple of things that we could do. The, uh, we have a number of like-minded nations that are working on trying to upgrade the World Trade Organization, which was invaluable. If, however, it does not have rules covering data flows and it needs to be upgraded. It doesn't mean that it needs to be thrown out. To the contrary, the foundation is something that we could not do any better in building. And uh, so uh, we need leadership there. And I think that uh, that... Uh, we could say it has not been as strong as you and I might agree that it should be. Uh, there are other things that we could do, uh, getting back into the Trans-Pacific Partnership. That set a model. Uh, the NAFTA set a model for the Uruguay round. And then the upgrade of the NAFTA, the I call it the MCA, the US MCA, brought in data flows and modernized uh, issues that were not covered in the NAFTA, those were picked up by the Trans-Pacific Partnership. What you find is when you have a fine agreement and people can see, wow, look what that has accomplished. They want one too. And we saw that with NAFTA creating the, uh, uh, the advance in trade. And we've seen that with uh, uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership borrowing the uh, provisions of, of the MCA. And so all we need to do is lead by example. Easy. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to invite anyone here who has a question. Please come up and join me if you would, because we need to use the microphone. Great. And Pastor Hill, good afternoon. I'm Diana Negroponte. Oh, it's great oh. to see you, Diana. Thank you. The NAFTA excluded energy, but the yes. NAFTA included protection for investors. How then can we use that agreement and its successor, the USMCA, to protect those US investors in the electrical industry in Mexico today? Well, that's a very good question because we have a dispute already brewing on that, uh, we are saying, and Canada has joined us in saying, that the Mexican efforts to uh, uh, take over the energy sector that uh, is in Mexico violates the uh, uh, USMCA that they've all agreed to. And uh, we will see whether uh, the president of Mexico 
and those advisors will take it to heart. I've talked to some friends in Mexico, and I think that they agree that it is a mistake. But, uh, you know, we have our political problems here at home. There is polarization, uh, and we see that in this hemisphere as well as uh, elsewhere. So uh, this is something that we need to work on. Maybe the three leaders meeting could put that high on the agenda and underscore to the Mexican president how really important it is to follow the rules and that uh, an open market. You know, we have a lot of investment in energy in Mexico. And uh, if he were to just make it all state owned, they would lose a lot of expertise and investment. Excellent, please. Ambassador Hill, thank you very much for your comments. Um, I appreciate it. My name is Rob Sweeney. I'm a student here at the Bush School. Um, there is some talk uh, out uh, in the uh, in the in the academic world of um, demographic and geopolitical changes leading to deglobalization. Um, we've talked a little bit about the future of trade, uh, but do you think that demographic changes and uh, geographic geopolitical changes uh, will lead to uh, a, a progressive deglobalization? Um, and if so, what would that mean for the NAFTA region? Uh, good question. And uh, let me just say that uh, no nation is going to be benefited by deglobalization. You simply cannot. Uh, look at our own country. With 5% of the world's population, we produce more than 15% of its output. We can't eat it all. And there are a lot of things that uh, we need from the outside world. The pandemic showed that. And uh, uh, when we had our supply chains sort of broken up, it, uh, it uh, really cost the government and it cost jobs and it hurt the global economy. Uh, what we need to do is to exercise leadership. And again, education at home and abroad as to the benefits of trade. And we, we, we can't be, the, we can't, argue one thing and then do another thing. We have to lead by example. And uh, we have not had an active role in trade for some period of time. We have, uh, uh, I was very excited that uh, when the last administration stepped down, I thought it was, uh, uh, that had been a very unhappy and difficult period for our government and our people. Uh, I was hoping that uh, with uh, the new president who had 36 years of experience in the Senate and uh, had chaired the uh, uh, international relations, so he knew people there, it was very gregarious and easy to like person. I had hoped that we would quickly move toward trade issues. But as I mentioned, his, his inbox has been rather overflowing. And so trade has not come to the top. Uh, but I, I think that because trade has tentacles that affect our diplomacy, our security, our, our geopolitical relationships, it's, uh, it's time to give it some attention. And it needs more attention than simply saying we need to have a worker-centric trade policy. We need to have an open global trade policy reminiscent of President Bush 41. Yeah, this is, uh, you're, you're speaking to the choir at the Bush School. I can tell you we're trying our <laughs> best to teach our students in that same vein. Is there another question perhaps? Yes, please come, come on up. Ambassador Hill, thank you for your uh, remarks. My name is Arlen Farhadi. I'm a MSFS student at Georgetown University. Um, my question is actually about the Uruguay Round Agreements. Um, so the Uruguay Round Agreements single undertaking approach was lauded as the most important and significant contribution when the negotiations concluded. 
Nowadays, it is seen uh, as though the simple, a sim single undertaking approach is deemed as its worst con contribution. In retrospect, what do you believe the Uruguay Round Agreement's most significant contribution to be and why? Well, let me say that the Uruguay Round, which upgraded the GATT, the GATT only dealt with tariffs. It did not have an effective dispute settlement mechanism. And after years of negotiation, the 123 nations agreed that uh, uh, on a set of rules that would tend to open up the markets and uh, would have a dispute settlement mechanism through the World Trade Organization, which for a couple of decades worked pretty well. I don't, uh, you know, I think that the step forward from the GATT to the Uruguay Round and the World Trade Organization was a giant step in the right direction. It's just that uh, we can't complain about what the uh, Uruguay Round didn't cover because technology has changed some of our priorities and our needs. We need to get back to the bargaining table and sit down. And it may be that as we move forward, it's going to require a series of like-minded nations sitting down and having a plurilateral agreement that can set the example. I thought that the Trans-Pacific Partnership would be a very good example. And when it showed the benefits, others would want to climb aboard. That has happened in the past repeatedly. And it's something that we haven't made happen. First, we pull out of it. That Pulling out of a trade agreement is not only that you lose that benefit, you lose the reliability. Do you want to negotiate with me over the sale of my house when you know that uh, uh, yesterday on my sale of my car, I backed out? No, you want to negotiate with someone that you can trust. And so we've got to rebuild the trust, rebuild our relationships. And I think trade is one of the ways to do it. And we ought to begin working with like-minded nations. I don't think there's any sensible person who could say that we want to throw away the World Trade Organization. Great. Yeah, I know there's been a lot of debate about replacing judges too in the World Trade Organization, right? And that's an ongoing debate. Have you been following that as well? And can let us oh, know I how that's... That there, there's a great ro uh, roadmap of the Walker Principles that the ambassador from New Zealand put forward. And uh, Jennifer Hillman has written brilliantly, I think, about uh, how we can fix the, the uh, World Trade Organization. Uh, the substantive rules need to be upgraded so that we have rules governing data flows and high technology. But the World Trade Organization that uh, decides on it, that they, you could have limits on the terms of the judges and that has been recommended, and uh, that uh, they are only to decide the facts on the that are presented to them, the law that applies to that fact, the rules that apply to those facts. They are not to what I call as a lawyer uh, to uh, uh, you know stare decisis. Well, we've had this decision once before, so we're going to expand it on this this subsequent. No, no, you decide this case on these facts. And uh, the, there has been a very good outline, but I haven't seen the kind of leadership that uh, uh, to get those new, that new format into play. Canada has led very well a group of like-minded nations to create a arbitration system that is different from the WTO. But I wanna, reinforce the WTO and keep it because I think it's invaluable and keep the rules there. And uh, if we have to move for, uh, ahead uh, subst substantively through plurilateral agreements, some of which could be open to uh, all of the uh, other nations when they meet the standard, some of them could be, I mean, you could formal uh, formalize how you want to proceed, but uh, it's, uh, uh, we need to move forward on our, our global trade rules. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Is there another question because from the audience, perhaps? I have one, if, if you don't mind, I'd like to continue the conversation a little bit. 
um, on the TPP, because what, you've mentioned that there would be positive trade benefits from the TPP. You've also mentioned that there would be positive, uh, basically sort of incentive effects, right? And uh, basically reputation effects that we would establish that were in negotiations. One thing though, that maybe I was hoping you could expand on was that one of the goals of the TPP essentially was in addition to the economic benefits, in addition to the other things you've said, was essentially to help circle China with like-minded countries that would agree on rules of trade that might help put pressure on China, especially in terms of state-owned enterprises, intellectual property, and other types of uh, protections, is to try and get China to mainly move towards us in the way we design the rules of trade and the rules of economic and exchange. Um, could you talk a little bit about trade, especially the TPP, as an instrument of foreign policy or economic diplomacy to put pressure on China to try and conform with what we would consider to be more conducive rules of growth? Well, China has sought to get into the TPP. If it gets into the TPP, it has to agree to the rules. And that's where we are falling short with the World Trade Organization because we blocked any enforcement of the rules. And, that, and so, uh, you know, I think the TPP is moving in the right direction. My, the way I would verbalize it is not to circle China. Uh, they can have their communist government and we have our, de uh, our democratic government. We get along with Vietnam. It has a communist government. There are a number of countries that have uh, uh, governments that we would not copy, but if they follow the rules and abide by the law, then they can be part of the uh, system and they benefit from being part of the system. Uh, China has already, in uh, the when it joined in 2001, agreed to uh, protection of intellectual property. And in fact, it has moved quite a bit in, uh, since it joined. Uh, why? It has more patents than any other country uh, since it has joined. Uh, uh, it, uh, it, uh, it, it sees the benefit, but if it doesn't enforce the rule that it agreed to, then we enforce, we take action against it. And, you know, there's even a, a, an article in the WTO, that if you repeatedly don't follow the rules and you're in, as a result, you're hurting the membership, uh, you can be expelled. And that, those, those devices should be used. We don't need to say we want to encircle you or we want to hold you down. No, we want you to be law abiding. Great. Is there a question from the audience that might have followed up on that? Yeah, Professor Schum. Introduce <laughs> uh, Thanks for the talk, Ambassador. Yeah, I'm Q. I'm an instructional assistant professor at Bushi School, DC teaching site. Uh, I have a question about fair trade. So fair trade. there are many debates on the meaning of fair trade, right? So all the people have a different concept of fair trade. So I'm wondering what kind of fair trade that the future U.S. trade policy has to pursue. Well, my definition of fair trade is that you follow the rules. And uh, if you're in a plurilateral agreement, you follow the rules of that plurilateral agreement. If you're in a regional agreement like the NAFTA, you follow those rules. And uh, uh, that is uh, what I call fair trade. And if you don't follow the rules, you are unfair. Simple. <laughs> um, one of the things that you mentioned about the North American Free Trade Agreement, if I could go back to that a little bit, was that it improved the relationship politically between the United States, Canada, and Mexico, which definitely was one of the benefits. But you also alluded to the idea of improved competitiveness of the United States by integrating uh, more carefully and more thoroughly with North America. Could you expand a little bit more on that idea on how increasing integration between Mexico, the United States and Canada increase the competitiveness of US industries? Well, I think that uh, opening up the markets 
to our two large neighbors, both for selling goods, but also building goods, creating goods, made us more competitive as it made them more competitive. You look at the, the wealth increase in Mexico compared to 1980, it's fantastic. And uh, uh, so all three of us have benefited from uh, the opening of our markets. We now make things together. We specialize. We take a widget from Mexico and a wheel part from Canada, and it makes our automobiles more uh, competitive. Uh, and it's across the board. So, uh, you know, George Schultz used to say, uh, maybe we shouldn't just talk about ourselves as Americans, we should talk about ourselves as North Americans. <laughs> and uh, what he was trying to say is this unit is the most powerful unit uh, of three governments that could get along, no hostility, two oceans on, you know, one ocean on each side, no hostility of neighbors that they could really be the best that there is. And uh, uh, so uh, that's what integration does. Uh, we have our separate uh, cultures and so forth. That's terrific. But uh, uh, we also have exchange of students and uh, mayors and uh, governors are doing a better job of trying to mix, you know, even in Canada, we have the sister states that have gotten together to try to work on keeping the Great Lakes clean. And uh, so the fact that we work together, sometimes one and one make three. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, I mean, that, that resonates with me because the first chapter of my dissertation showed that North America is actually a single labor market. It's not three separate labor markets. It's one right. unified labor market. And that's a good way to think about it. So thank you for raising that image with us. We have another question. Yes. Vasta Hill, I'm coming back. I'm glad, Diana. And I'm coming back on this issue of fair trade. Fair trade. Because I don't think there is fair trade. And you let me tell you why. Now. I want to focus on agriculture. Yes. You will recall in the negotiations for the NAFTA that the United States, as a major producer of corn, yes. would need special terms in order to protect Mexican corn farmers. And likewise on sugar. Now, we reach that with the NAFTA, and I think we have an fair agricultural exchange with Mexico. But when we get to our trade agreements and trade with Africa, Africans believe that it is unfair, that they cannot compete with the efficiency of American agricultural producers of sugar or other products that they wish to sell to us. So I think we must be realistic that the world is not a fair place. And we need to recognize that smaller countries with less efficient agricultural systems may need some additional help or protections if we are to have a fair trade agreement with them. Thank you. Good point. And let me just say that there's two aspects of your position. One is that uh, they need help. That's a humanitarian issue. And uh, where we have a, a trade agreement with these countries and, uh, and not too many of the very poor countries other than the WTO. Um, but the other thing is, let's admit it, we still have high tariffs on sugar, wheat, corn, um, soy, several. So we can't brag about the fact that we're perfect. Uh, we have very high tariffs so that Bangladesh pays us more in tariffs on a smidgen of trade than does France on their trade. France is upscale and Bangladesh is not. And so that is a something in the trade system 
that we have to fix. And we, again, could lead by example. Uh, the uh, general system of uh, general system of preference GSP, uh, which low we we try to lower the tariffs to some of the poorer countries, that has not we have not been as effective as some would say because the data I have seen more recent most recently shows that uh, we're, the poor countries are still paying higher tariffs than the rich countries. Mm -hmm. So this semester at the Bush School, I'm teaching a class called The Fundamentals of Global Economy. And I will say that through your comments, you've covered most of my class. So thank <laughs> you very much. Uh, that's been fun. One of the topics that we talk about that you talked about is this idea of helping to compensate people who have lost from trade. And you mentioned these moving subsidies, training subsidies, and that sort of thing. But, but as an economist, I'm an economist, and, and one of the things that always kind of uh, confuses us is why are these policies so difficult to implement? Why are they so difficult to put those in place? Because the lack of them generates a significant backlash against trade. So it right. seems like it is a rather obvious solution, but yet we have such a hard time doing it. Why do you think that is? We need you to teach more classes. Doing the best I can. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's uh it is uh there i mean we're not perfect but uh we stand out when compared with others <laughs> in the trade world and so like diana said that uh, uh our, we, we have not done all we can with poor countries and we have not here at home we haven't done all we can to train our workers to deal with the uh the challenges that they're facing with the rapid change in technology. And uh, there are some companies that uh, say that they will pay the worker to come and uh, be trained and so forth, but uh, uh, it's hard to get information about that. And uh, right now the employment picture is not one that would induce uh, a lot of programs along those lines, but it's something that we clearly need. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yes, we definitely agree. We gotta keep thinking of ways to educate the rest of the country. And that's why we're really happy you're joining us with this event tonight. This is definitely part of that mission and you're playing a critical part. Um, we do have a question online. Uh, someone from Zoom did send in a question. I'd like to share that with you. And that is um, through, you know, since you were working on NAFTA up to today, globalization has changed, markets have changed. How have you seen are the greatest changes in U.S. trade over the last, you know, 20 or, or 30 years? How has the United States changed its, its trade? Are we exporting or importing different things? Or, or what do you think have been the most significant changes? It's not that uh, it, the most significant changes, I think, are the rapid increase in services exports. Um, you know, you sell whether you're selling uh, insurance or you're selling, uh, giving advice on uh, on uh, uh, how to build something um, or technology. You know, uh, all of those things. That is the big change. And uh, in fact, our our in our uh, output with respect to services has gone up. And uh, so. The, the question is, uh, uh, has that changed globally? Yes. Uh, so we have to have better rules governing services, which I think we're trying to do. I mean, the Trans-Pacific Partnership tried to do that. We started that in the uh, NAFTA, but my goodness, the economy has changed so dramatically since 1994. I mean, we're talking uh, about huge changes that we need to keep that up to date. And I think we're falling behind in not getting a uh, good trade policy out and selling it at home and abroad. So one of the topics that I've been working on following in, in sort of your footsteps, of course, trying to, I'm far <laughs> behind, of course, um, but that is that we renegotiated NAFTA to update it based on what you just said, right? The economy changed, there's new technologies. 
Do you think that there's room to renegotiate other agreements as well, such as maybe the Central American Free Trade Agreement or the U.S. Jordan was another one that, that we had from quite some time ago? What are your views on, on revisiting other existing U.S. trade agreements? Um, well, obviously, they all need to be updated because they're all don't cover some of the technologies that we have today. Uh, we have, I think, 14 trade agreements with 20 countries. Uh, and uh, uh, which is not a whole lot. Uh, and uh, all of them are old, relatively old. We have done some upgrading with respect to Korea, but uh, we are, trade has not been high on our agenda for the past couple of administrations. And uh, uh, it's too bad because it has such tentacles that reach into security diplomacy, all sorts of activities that are positively impacted by good trade rules that generate uh, good relationships. We have another question online, which I think will probably be the last one um, because we're running out of time and I want to respect everyone's time. And that is, there's a question about the Abraham Accords signed in the fall of 2020. If you, how you think the benefits of those, have they been benefiting the signatories from the Middle East or what's been your impression of the Abraham Accords so far, if you have one? Um, I don't really have a, uh, uh, most, mo most people who have looked at it that want to keep the, the agreement. They think that, that we should enforce it and uh, it, it should be an, an enforceable agreement. And uh, we don't need friction. Uh, uh, with Israel and Middle East uh, areas. But uh, uh, I don't know that we're particularly focused on trying to change or alter it in any way. Uh, maybe you do. Great. Well, it was a question from the internet, so I have no idea who sent that in. So I'm <laughs> not going to engage in the debate. Um, <laughs> But I will say I wanted to thank you so much, Ambassador, not only for your presence here tonight, but for inspiring America and my entire career. It's been a real pleasure. And I want to thank all of everyone here who's joined us in person and everyone on Zoom uh, as well. I do want to reiterate uh, and thank uh, Ambassador Barco and, and Rob Mosbacher and reiterate what Rob Mosbacher had said earlier about the November 10th. Uh, event in which he will be talking about international finance, same time, same place, just on November 10th. Uh, we look forward to seeing you there. And for those of you who are here at the Bush School DC, and hopefully to entice those of you who uh, are on Zoom, but I think you're coming next time, we have a small reception out in the lobby with a lot of food and beverages, and we hope that you will stay uh, to continue the conversation. So please join me in thanking Ambassador Hills for a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It's been a lovely experience and I'm so sorry I'm not there in person. Maybe I can join you on the 10th. <laughs> that would be great. You're always welcome at the Bush School Ambassador. <laughs> Thank Anytime. you. Very. This is your second Thank home. You. Thank you very much and good night, everyone.